of interesting to me. I'm, I'm trying to be this like fiery revivalist, you know, um, deliverance, warfare kind of preacher, and God keeps taking me to Genesis. I don't know what's going on. It's kind of weird. I'm actually going to read the entire story of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness. I'm reading the New American Standard. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were below the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters... Below the, uh, below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed. And fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit according to their kind, with seed in them. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kind. And trees bearing fruit with seed in them according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning. A third day. Then God said... Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and they shall serve as signs and for seasons and for days and years, and they shall serve as lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock and crawling things, and animals of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. God made the animals of the earth according to their kind, and the livestock according to their kind, and everything that crawls on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every animal on the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. And so the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their heavenly lights. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because on it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. That should have been part of chapter one. That's just my opinion. <laughs> It's like the whole creation story in one chapter except for a couple extra verses. How often do we read the story of creation? I mean, really read it and think about it. I was reading and studying and it occurred to me, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, it says, God said, let there be light and there was light. The very first thing God created was not light. And I'm not talking about one and two where it talks about the formless earth and darkness and the waters. The first thing there was actually the sound of his voice. He spoke. That's why when I was reading that, I kept emphasizing, and God said, because he spoke things into existence. Some people like to imagine the creation story as, as God tinkering with the universe, that he's sitting down there and moving this and placing that. And No, he just spoke. I'm not here to talk about creationism versus evolution or anything like that. I'm here to talk about God's voice, the words he spoke. Let there be light, and there was light. The first thing there was actually sound. His words, his words preceded the creation of everything, and God said. I'm talking about that initial spark of light that we all equate to the beginning of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light, the light that started it all. That moment was preceded by the voice of God, the word of God. The Word of God. If you're a moderately seasoned believer, I'm sure most of us are, I'm sure some of you may be thinking about John chapter 1. Not everyone who hears this may know the connection. I'm going to take a look at them together. Jesus and uh, Jesus, <laughs> Genesis and John both start with in the beginning. Those are the first three words in Genesis. They're also the first three words in the book of John. And both actually give a look into that period of time, but from a vastly different perspective. So go to John chapter 1, verse 1. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 is all we're going to look at. I'm not going to read the entire first chapter like I did with Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, darkness did not grasp it. That word, of course, is Jesus. So we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all present at creation. Because we know the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. God was there creating and everything was being created through Jesus who was present there at creation as well. Again, not really what I'm talking about. But again, I'm focusing on the Word of God being present. The beginning, the Word. He gave that, that language to mankind. We see God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden and talking with them. Language was present. He used words to communicate with them. He didn't just like telepathically put thoughts and feelings into their mind. He spoke with them. He used words. Aaron's mom loves to talk about Genesis chapter 3 where it says that um, God walked with them in the cool of the evening. It's her favorite verse because she loves to think about that moment and what those moments must have been like to share that, that, that terrain with God and to, to walk and talk with Him. And I, I think that's, that's a pretty, um, pretty fun subject to think on too. I mean, to just be in His presence here on earth, just to walk and talk with Him. Wow. But He gave language. He gave language. Sadly, it didn't take long for language and communication to become corrupted to a point of contention with God. Obviously, we saw it at the beginning with the serpent speaking to Eve, speaking lies and deception. And we can look in the book of Genesis at chapter 11. It talks about the Tower of Babel. It says, now all the earth, this is Genesis 11, starting at verse 1. Now all the earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as, the, as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone. And they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let's make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. Now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they all have the same language. And this is what they've started to do. And now nothing which they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they stopped building the city. Therefore it was named Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So from Genesis 1.1 to Genesis, Genesis 11, God had to mess up that language, that one that he shared with Adam and Eve when he walked around the garden and and communed with him. It had become corrupted and used to such, such pride that man was going to build a tower to heaven. And God said, no. This isn't the way it works. That's not what you're here to do. So let's fast forward to today. Of course, today with modern technology, internet connections, and translation software, we basically kind of have one language again. We can communicate with anybody anywhere in the world. It's kind of a scary thought when you put it into perspective with what God did last time that happened. There are still political separations. I, I don't have time to go into the use of words throughout Scripture. It's such a vastly covered topic, but I do have a lot of Scriptures. Is it okay if I read a lot of the Bible tonight? A little, little less exegesis and eisegesis and more just reading scripture. So Moses' relationship with using the right words is arguably one of the most potent portrayals of this idea. He talks a lot about words with God 
and how he doesn't have the right words. And of course, God tells him he'll give him the words and back him up when he says the words. And he goes into the, 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 the Egypt and to Pharaoh and he says the, word God, the words God tells him to say and God shows up. There's a lot of words that are going on there. And he structures words even after that in a way that's with, without dispute. We see it throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He uses words to write the law. He uses words to set things in order, to count the tribes, to separate the tribes, to establish the temple, all using words as a leader. And of course, writing those words into the first five books of the Bible. We see it continue with Aaron and Joshua down the line. Samuel and the use of words is of paramount importance. Again, I'm not going to go into all of these. There's just too many. I mean, literally hundreds of uses almost in every book when we talk about words. David in his prayers and worship carefully selected which words to use. The prophets, of course, had to be sure the words they spoke were correct. They were used correctly because they were from the Lord and in the intention that God placed on them because the correct words would only work to create the change in the people at that time as well as to be used in what we now have in the Bible. They were the word of God being spoken through the prophets at that time. So the words they used were extremely important. Interestingly, the book of Job, this one kind of surprised me because I've read Job before. But it really surprised me how much the book of Job deals with words. It talks a lot about the right words and the wrong words. It talks about empty words. It talks about words without knowledge. It talks about gentle words and words without wisdom. If you have a, an internet connection, just type in the word words and look in just Job. I mean, there's... Tons. It's, it's, it's a big deal in Job. Didn't realize it before. I'll point, point one out. Job 19.2 says, How long will you torment me and crush me with words? That was just an example. I liked that one. We really don't have time to talk about the words in Proverbs. Proverbs deals very heavily with words, words of wisdom, take hold of my words, receive my words, do not turn away from my words, pay attention to my words. The list seems almost endless. We see the pattern through Ecclesiastes. Isaiah deals heavily with it. God does not retract his words. Your words are only empty words. Hear these words. Jeremiah, same thing. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, it all continues. And that's just the Old Testament. Why am I pointing this out? Words matter to God. It's the first thing in creation. He talks about it endlessly throughout all of Scripture. Words matter to God. From Genesis through the Law and the Prophets, of course we know it doesn't end there. Jesus talked at length about words. Whoever hears these words of mine... Matthew 12, 34 through 37, if you want to write that down. I'm not going to take time for us to turn to all of these. I said I have a lot. So just, I'll just give you time to write them down if you want to look them up later. Or you can watch it back on YouTube. Matthew 12, 34 through 37. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I didn't say that, Jesus did. Hold up. Every idle word you speak, you're going to give an account. You're going to be justified and condemned by the words. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why the words matter. It's because they come from here. Matthew 24, 35. Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
Mark 8, 38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy, of a the holy angels. That was a very fast synopsis of words in the Bible. We didn't even look at the words like speech, mouth, tongue, decree, say, pray, prophesy, sing, shout. So many other words. Those was just the word words from the Bible. And that was just a few of them. And then there's also words like hear, listen. That means something's being said. Presence of words most of the time. This is a massive subject in the Word of God. In the Word of God, we even call it that. Words matter to God. Let me hit a few highlights for the sake of driving the point home. There are literally hundreds of entries. Here's just a few for you note takers. Ecclesiastes 5, 6. It says, Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Do not let your speech cause you to sin. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Something's going on there. Colossians <coughs> chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. I've read this one before up here. Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now, this is now a separate thought, now you also rid yourselves of all of them. Anger, wrath, malice. Here's the first one that deals with words. Slander. And obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. That's three in a row dealing with words. Since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 34, 13 says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Psalm 39, verse 1 says, I said I will keep watch over my ways so that I do not sin with my tongue. I will keep watch over my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. So David had some wisdom there to say, I'm going to shut up now. Proverbs I said I, there's a lot in Proverbs. This, this is one that I picked out because there's quite a bit in one spot. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. This is one of my favorite parts of Proverbs is when he lists the six things the Lord hates, but there's seven that are an abomination to him. I love those ones. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. That could almost be words. Feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who declares lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. That's like three and a half out of seven. So half of those were, are dealing with words. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. I said I had a lot of scripture. I'm not done yet. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Remember that one, because we're coming back to that one. Another book that deals heavily with words is the book of James. I picked a couple out. James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks of himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. So if you don't bridle your tongue and you deceive your heart, then your religion or what this is referring to is our relationship with the Lord is worthless. Interesting. James 3, 3 through 10. This is probably one of the ones that everybody thinks about when you talk about what the Bible has to say about words. One of the big ones. Now if we put bits into the horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their whole body as well. Look at the ships too. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are nevertheless directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot determines. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. I'm going to read that one again. The tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our body's part as that which defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, you know those ones God created in Genesis 1.1, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one among mankind can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Lots of scripture. You guys okay with reading the Bible tonight? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you. There's a, there's a, there's a reference to words. Must not be mentioned among you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness or foolish talk, or vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of obedience. Therefore do not become partakers with them. For you are once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. I'm going to stop there. There's almost 200 references to curses in Scripture. I didn't even talk about lies, false witness, falsehood, deception, or many others. There is no way I could cover all of, the, all of it that the Bible has to say about our words. So I'm going to start somewhere easy. I'm not going to linger on these points. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to read something that um, Vlad Savchuk posted. Anybody not know who Vlad Savchuk is? He's a deliverance minister. He was part of the, the uh, come out in Jesus' name. But uh, that's Vlad Savchuk. He posted this on Facebook. And 
it just it just seemed fitting. He said, cursing, is it okay for Christians? Cursing is defined as using profanity to bring e or to bring evil upon. Cursing is a sign that you are in a bad place spiritually. When denying Jesus, Peter was swearing and cursing in Matthew 26. Profanity is evidence of ignorance. Those using profane language often, often lack the vocabulary to express themselves without resorting to gutter language. No Christian should be guilty of such unbecoming talk. KFC's founder once said that his conversion to Christ cost him half his vocabulary. And mom gave me a, an interesting paper. I didn't bring it. I'm not going to read it. But it was an interesting article that there are some Christian artists that are starting to use vulgarity in their, in their songs. Um, they're re actually releasing the uh, family-friendly version and the not-so-family-friendly version. Um, and for some reason, these Christian music publishers are just giving it a pass. I, I don't really know what's going on. But obviously, it's an issue in, in the church of today. I personally have seen it online, and, and you know, people, people that profess to be a Christian or say that they're saved, they have no problem just stringing the words together. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 and 30 says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But if there is any good word for edification, according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God's word forbids dirty talk and corrupt words, and they grieve the Holy Spirit. We will give an account before God for every word. Matthew 12, 37 says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I read that one earlier. i just bring it back into, into uh, focus here. And this is still Vlad's post, by the way. This is, I'm still reading what Vlad wrote. He said, Are you struggling with cussing? You need to repent. Number one, repent. Number two, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Number three, yield your lips to the Spirit. Number four, change your environment. In other words, stop listening to and watching things and being around people that use that language. And number five, speak in tongues. So that's Vlad's post. Let's move on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have you turn with me to uh, 2 John. It's towards the back for those that, you don't, those that may not know. It's right after 1 John and be right before 3 John. <laughs> 2 John chapter 1. We're, we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. It said what it said. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Read verse 11 again if you aren't sure. Someone's coming to you and they're preaching a false Christ or anything that is different than what you know the word of God to be. You're not even supposed to say hi to him. To give him a greeting. Otherwise, you're participating in their evil deeds. You're giving them even a moment of your time. It said what it said. Some people are going to say I'm crazy. Some people are going to say I'm taking this too far. What we say matters to God. I'm an extremist. Maybe not the type of extremist you guys are thinking of. Oh, maybe I am. I don't know. But what I mean is that 
if you give me a premise or a thought or an idea, I'm going to take it to the furthest extreme I can imagine. And if it still holds true, then it's a valid thought or idea. If it doesn't hold tr true under the most extreme circumstances, then there's a flaw. That's how I think about things. Here's my extremist premise of the day. If any of our words matter, then all of our words matter. Conversely, if only some of our words matter, then none of our words matter. Does that make sense? Does that hold, hold true to you? What we say matters to God. All of it. Every word that comes from our mouth matters to God. Don't let idle words invalidate your prayers. Idle words are lazy, unemployed, flippant, and trivial words which disqualify your meaningful words. Watch over your words. Make sure they have meaning. Choose them carefully. Speak skillfully. I drive Aaron crazy, right? I don't know. <laughs> because I take so long to answer. And I have the longest pauses in the middle of a sentence. Much like I'm doing right now. It's a decision I made when I was young to stop speaking thoughtlessly. I used to just jabber on and on without a thought in my head. And it all started when I was a teenager. I heard about this thing where you read the book of Proverbs every month. It's got 31 chapters, so you read a chapter every day. And then if you're on a month that has 30, 30 days, you read the last two on the last day. In February, you read the last three or four, whatever it is. My math brain isn't working. I did that for over a year. And I saw so much in there about words, speech, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I decided then and there that I was going to tame my tongue. Now, am I perfect in this, Aaron? <laughs> no, 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 of course not, of course not. I have made many errors in my speech. I have said thoughtless things and I've hurt people's feelings. I have hurt my wife's feelings, I've hurt my children's feelings, I've probably hurt other people's feelings, my mother's probably somewhere along the way. I've said things I didn't mean. I've said things I shouldn't have said. But the premise and, and the intention is still true, that what we say matters to God, and we need to guard what comes out of our mouth. So if words matter to God, doesn't it stand to reason that the enemy, Satan, would also use words as well? That he would alter, change, and manipulate words. That he would infiltrate the lexicon. I like that word that he would subvert the definitions, that he would sneak into and change the patterns of our language to make us say things that hold negative spiritual power, to make us say curses and spells without us even realizing it. What? I would never. Some easier, obvious ones are words like gay. That's an easy one. The LGBTQ plus loves to play semantics and word games. They're sexually perverted and it only stands to reason they would also pervert the language and scripture as well. We have just from that demographic alone happy little words that have been used to cover the evil hidden within such as maps, which is minor attracted persons. In other words, people that like kids, they just call them maps. They're just maps. Trans, queer, even the name LGBTQ plus sounds so interesting and fun. You remember when Florida was doing that thing in the school to try and cut back on things and they were, everybody was calling it the don't say gay bill? It really wasn't about that, but they, they, that's what they were calling it, you know, hatefully. Oh, it's just a don't say gay bill. That was a falsehood. That's not really what the bill said, but I agree. Don't say gay. Don't say gay. The Bible calls it homosexuality. Sexual perversion. 
perverse spirits, the lust of the flesh. It makes it clear that that's an abomination to God and will lead to eternal damnation in hell. We should not be playing happy word games. It's not gay. We should be preaching repentance, freedom, and deliverance to them. They can be free and happy and joyful in the Lord. That's what gay used to mean anyway. There's a prolific American sci-fi author who was born in 1928 and died in 1982. His name is Philip K. Dick. He said, the, and he was an amazing writer, he said, the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use those words. We know the devil has infiltrated our language in some very obvious ways. We talked about cursing. We talked about the homosexual agendas. What about some less obvious ones? You've been on board with me so far, right? This is where some people might think I'm a little bit nuts, or that I'm taking this too far, or I'm getting too serious, or getting too dogmatic, getting too legalistic. But I will say again, if any of our words matter, then all of our words matter. What we say matters to God. I'm just going to breeze through this. I don't want to take all, all night. It's already after nine. Um, the first one that, that, that I want to bring out is the, we use the word luck. Like, good luck. Hey, good luck. Oh, you got a job interview? Good luck. What in the world are we saying? I'm guilty of it. I've caught myself. Do you believe in luck? Or do you believe in the blessings and the grace of God? Saying good luck to somebody is actually saying a spell over them. Because luck is used in magic. Luck is used in witchcraft. That's a spell. You either have favor with God and receive His blessings, or you have demonic influence and receive what they have to offer. The word fortunate is the same thing. It has roots in, in, in fortune, telling a fortune, having good fortune. Another one is, I wish. I wish they go, that would, the person would stop doing that. I wish they would leave me alone. I wish, I wish, I wish. You do? You got a genie in a bottle? You wishing on a star? Are you praying to the God who created the stars? Because if it's a prayer, then you're not, you're not wishing, you're praying. You should say, I pray. I pray that that person finds a better way to communicate with me. You know, instead of I wish they would leave me alone. Am I taking this too far? Am I being too, too legalistic? You can answer in your own mind. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> mind over matter. We, that's a common phrase we use. You know? You can do it. It's just mind over matter. That sounds like a perversion of faith to me. The words I hate, got to be careful about this one. It means you desire to see someone dead and in hell for eternity. Oh, I hate her. You do? You want to see her dead and in hell for eternity? Better watch out what you say. What about if we say, oh, thank God. Is that just a catchphrase, taking his name in vain, or are we actually, from our heart, thanking God for whatever just happened? Is it a prayer of thanks and gratitude to God, or is it just a reaction? Got to be careful. I'm going to skip ahead. I don't want to take all night. Doctrines, doctrine strongholds of the mind. I see it online all the time, people giving words of doctrine that are not biblical. They're going to give account for their words and those that they led astray. I've seen people online mocking tongues. I just saw it today. Someone was saying something about um, those churches that, that do the shaka laka laka or something like that. And I was just like, man, you are playing with fire. What about amen? 
What are we saying amen to? I see, I hear it in society from people that aren't even believers, like, um, you know, girls saying, and that guy cheated on me, we're done. And the other one's like, amen, sister, you know. Amen. I, and I saw it on um, some, post, some post on Facebook was, was talking about an, a new browser for the internet that's all safe and, and will never sell your security. And people were saying, amen. I'm like, what are you amening? Browser security? That doesn't even make sense. I have a whole bunch of other examples. I'm just going to skip some of them because it's just ridiculous. The words we say in our prayers, we need to make sure they're not in vain or empty. What's the difference between a spell and a prayer? What's the difference between a blessing and a curse? In Christianity, we call it faith. In witchcraft, they call it intention. So make sure that we're praying to God about things that God would desire in a, a way that is focused on God. I've talked about faith. I've talked about power, gifts, promises, kingdom authority. Do we believe the Bible? Do we really? It says in Proverbs 18, 21, and I said we were going to come back to this one, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. If the Bible is true, then we better be really careful about what we say. I quoted a scripture to someone. They said, you're basing this off of one verse, as though that's not enough. I said, yeah, God only has to say it one time for it to matter. Why should he have to repeat himself? Obviously he does, but he really shouldn't have to. If he didn't have to repeat himself to thick-headed people like us, the Bible would probably be like half as thick. I remember my mom saying, if I told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah, one verse is all I need. It says it once, that's enough. It just blows people's mind. We say a lot of things in anger if we're not guarding our tongue. I want to ask you something. If you get mad at someone and then you're alone in your house or in your room or in your car and you start blasting that person. Oh, that guy just... You know, you start saying things. Who are you talking to? We give an account for every word. Does somebody have to hear a bad word for it to be a bad word? Who are you talking to? Aaron's mom said that. Who are you talking to? Right, right, Aaron? She's tired of me asking her questions from the pulpit. She's like, please don't talk to me. Aaron, Aaron's the one that told me that line. Who are you talking to? Someone's always listening. Somebody listening. What about hurting people with truth? I might, might say something that upset someone or offends them. That doesn't mean what I said was wrong or should be repented of. I answer to God for the words I say, whether or not I'm speaking the truth in love. If I am, then I have no need to repent. Sometimes the truth hurts. Ephesians 4 is huge on this. Proverbs, James, Job, Jeremiah, the list goes on and on. It doesn't mean that I can say truth with a mean-spiritedness. No, I have to speak the truth in love. But just because somebody gets hurt by the truth doesn't mean it was unloving. I'm going to give an account for every word. I want to take it one step further and challenge us on this. This, is going to, this. this might dig a little deep. Maybe I'm wrong. Pastor, you can throw me off the pulpit if I'm wrong. What we say is of equal import to what we do. Works and words go hand in hand. Before you throw me off the pulpit, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 again. It's just one verse. That's all I need. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 says, Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. People in our society like to say, Actions speak louder than words. Let's talk about that idea. It's a common phrase, but is it biblical? Let's take a look. If I say I will do something good and then fail to do it, which is worse? 
My lack of action or my lie? If I say I didn't do something bad, but I did, which is worse? My sin or my lie about my sin? Are not both sides of this hypocrisy evil? It is a double evil in why Jesus spoke so adamantly against hypocrites. Do actions speak louder than words? I get what they mean. I get what they mean, but when they, when they say this, but the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We read that earlier in Matthew. Whatever's abundant in your heart will flow out your mouth. So what's abundant in our hearts tonight? Truth or lies? Blessings or cursings? Edification or gossip? Forgiveness or bitterness? Love or hatred? Encouragement or jealousy? What are you testifying to? God's grace or the works of darkness? Remember, it doesn't matter if we say things to people's faces or behind their backs. Like I said, someone is always listening. God always hears, and don't think for a second that the enemy is not prowling around listening for words of slander, backbiting, jealousy, bitterness, or unforgiveness to latch on to. Someone is always listening, and what we say matters. Do actions speak louder than words? Modern society... It's true, we can say one thing and do another. That's hypocrisy both in what we say and what we do. Which is the hypocritical part? What we did or what we said? It's a combination of the two, right? Equal import. Society, though, has become so actions-oriented while at the same time inundated with more words than ever before in history. We have television, music, YouTube, blogs, network news, podcasts, documentaries, news articles, opinions, social media, words, 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 and you're just like, that's enough. So many words that now what we say or write has lost all impact. Our words have become hollow, trite, and meaningless. The Bible says to let your yes be yes and your no be no. It should be a simple thing, right? You want to come up here and play some... I'm wrapping up. I skipped some stuff, so... It's coming up on 9.30 here soon. I don't want to go too late. God knows our hearts. Are we honest with Him? Those are the most important words we really speak, or the ones we speak to God. And He already knows our hearts. So it would be really foolish to not be honest with him. He knows us. He knows our motivations. He knows if we are being honest with him, with ourselves and with others. He knows if there is purity in our purpose. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We love that. It's true and it's powerful, but that's not the whole verse. Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even unto death. Last week we sang that song, I love you, Lord, I love you more than life. Is that a true statement of your love for Jesus? I mean, right now, gun to your head, deny Christ or die. What do you choose? We sing it. I love you, Lord. I love you more than life. We said that to God. It's a terrible thought. That type of thing has happened in the past. It's probably happening in other parts of the world, and it may be happening in America very soon. It's possible. So choose you this day whom you will serve. Do you love the Lord more than life or are you lying to God when you sing that song? He knows your heart. It's one thing when we're dishonest with others and it's even another thing when we're dishonest with ourselves but it's something completely different when we're dishonest with the Holy Spirit.
That's how Ananias and Sapphira died. They lied to God and he took their life. What we say matters to God, but what we say to God matters to him even more. We need to be cautious about these things. Our testimony, sharing the gospel, preaching, teaching, witnessing. I'm going to give an account for the words that I'm saying here tonight. The prayers that we pray. When we prophesy. When we give an interpretation to tongues. When we're commanding a spirit or giving an exhortation. We're moving in the Spirit and we have to make sure that the words we're saying are actually from God. I'm not going to make an altar call tonight. If you have something that you feel that you need to repent about or seek God about on this subject, the altars are here. They, they always are. You shouldn't have to be called down. If you feel that you should be here, spend time with Him until He tells you you're done. You know, maybe you've said negative words about someone here. You should probably deal with that now if they're here. This may be your only chance to do so. The altars are open. If you need to be here, then get here.